Hello, everyone. Hope you are well. Came across a very, very interesting article on CNBC's homepage. You know what's great is uh, I can't stand watching CNBC, but just going to their homepage really quick and just getting the headlines so you don't have to hear them speak is actually a, a great way to go about it. <laughs> really, it really uh, helps ease my blood pressure, so to speak. But um, check this out. Fed, oh, almost forgot. Damn it. Screen share. Got it. There we go. Okay. Back to what I was saying. Fed policy changes could be coming in response to bond market turmoil, economists say. And you guys know I, I'm not one to really brag or toot my own horn, but I, I do want to point out the fact that <laughs> you will see in this article, the economists are a little behind the curve here. They're uh, just catching up with the George Gammon YouTube channel. And for those of you who watched my video on, what was it, Thursday of last week, I believe, where I talked about Janet Yellen dumping $1.1 trillion from the TGA into the real economy and those bank reserves hitting the system, hitting the commercial banking system. Uh, which is effectively quantitative easing and how that could screw up the yield curve. Um, my point is I was talking about that last Thursday on the video. And now all of a sudden, this is March 1st. And look who's talking about it. CNBC. <laughs> so, and I want to give credit where credit is due. I got it from uh, my buddy, Kevin Muir. And uh, he talked about it on Macro Voice. I actually interviewed him today. That'll be up this uh, this evening on a, on the channel. But uh, my point is, CNBC's just now catching up. And so you say, well, George, maybe they're seeing something here that you are not. You would be wrong. <laughs> Check this out. The Federal Reserve could have two policy tweaks in store as soon as this month. Investors, economists, and the George Gammon YouTube channel say <laughs> one would be the rebirth of Operation Twist, in which the Fed sells short term bills and buys long duration bonds. Why would they do that? Because the yield curve could potentially go negative on the short end, just like we talked about in my video, and the long end of the curve is going up into the no bueno zone. So we know that interest rates are the opposite or the inverse of the price. So if the Fed is selling short-term T-bills. That means they're adding supply into the market. Okay, well, if there's additional supply, usually the price would go down. If the price goes down, the interest rate goes up, which hopefully brings those rates above negative or where they could go negative, uh, enough above zero to where the Fed can sleep at night. <laughs> let's say. So then why do they buy the long end of the curve? The exact same reason, but they just want the opposite effect. So they're creating more supply at the front end and they're creating more demand at the long end of the curve. So let's keep going here. Others could see an increase in rates. Let's see others like economists and they again, they forgot to mention the George Gammon YouTube channel here. What are they thinking? Others, such as the George Gammon YouTube channel, could see an increase in rates on excess reserves and overnight repo operations. Again, exactly what I went over 
in my video Thursday night, <laughs> the moves would be to address market stability rather than economic concerns. And that's, this is laughable, of course, because as if they're mutually exclusive, right? As though we could have a complete collapse in the repo market, as an example, and the economy would just keep humming right along <laughs> like, like nothing ever happened. Of course, you guys know from watching my channel that that's utter nonsense. And the dollar funding markets are incredibly important to the overall economy, which is built on da, 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 asset prices, confidence. What's the third? Debt. You got it. So without the dollar funding markets, the ability to issue debt would be dramatically hampered. And if that's one of the, we'll call it pillars, <laughs> for lack of a better word, that the United States economy is built on, then that leg falls, the economy, the whole house of cards would come crashing down. So this statement is just um, short-sighted, let's say. They, they, they're not, uh, this gentleman, I don't know who this is, but he doesn't really, I think he's just reporting on what's happening and he doesn't really understand uh, what's happening. And that's fair, you know, he's, he's a reporter. He's not a, a macro geek like myself. And this is kind of interesting too. While the Fed Reserve, the Federal Reserve may not raise its benchmark interest rate for years, there's growing expectations it may tweak policy soon to address recent turmoil in the bond market. Now, what's interesting here, um, hopefully my highlights. Not in my oh no, there they are. Okay. So I don't know if maybe I didn't highlight it, but that's okay. I can just explain it to you. What they, they're talking about is the Fed potentially increasing IOR or IOER, what it was when there was actually reserve requirements for the bank <laughs> or banks. And you guys know by watching my YouTube channel that they took out the reserve requirements uh, back in March of 2020. So, and if you guys don't know, you're probably still under the assumption that banks have a 10% reserve requirement. <clears throat> no mas, <clears throat> excuse me. And even back prior to 2020, that was only applicable to some of the banks in the United States. Now, uh, none of the banks have a reserve requirement at all. <clears throat> so that uh, interest on excess reserves really isn't applicable because there are no excess reserves. <laughs> Anything above zero is, uh, is, is um, or basically there are no excess reserves. So uh, they're all just reserves. So now they're calling it IOR instead of IOER. Now what's, for those of you who are a little more sophisticated, you know that that's one of the mechanisms, the main mechanism that the Fed uses to control the Fed funds rate and that's their, their target rate. And um, it's not an exact interest rate. A lot of people think that if they're setting it at zero, then it's that's bam, right there at zero. It's, it's exact, it's precise, but that's not the way it works. They set a target range. So right now the target range is from zero to 25 basis points or 0.25%. So that's where the Fed wants the banks lending to each other overnight. So the effective Fed funds rate. Um, so I think they were saying in the article, which I sh had highlighted, that, uh, oh, here we go, here we go, here we go. So let's highlight this, which I should have done already. <laughs> One other move it could is increase interest on excess reserves from 10 basis points to 15 basis points uh, through their essentially Though there are, though there essentially are no excess reserves now due to the Fed dropping the minimum. Okay, just what we went over. So I don't know. And my point here is that they can raise IOER 
within their range without having to come out and say that they're increasing interest rates. That's kind of what I'm getting at here. So they can keep the rate, their rate pegged at zero, which is really between zero and 25 basis points, but they can still increase IOER without coming out and saying and announcing that they're raising interest rates. Because if they said that, then they'd have to take IOER, meaning if they came out and said, okay, okay, guys, we're increasing interest rates, so let's say 1%, well, then they'd have to move IOER up to at least 1%, maybe you know, 1.05 uh, or something like that. So they're trying to just tweak it, like really, really fine tune it, which is stupid. It's, it's most likely not going to work. Like five basis points is really going to make a difference because they're doing this because they're trying to make sure that low end is, is getting above zero to where there's a little wiggle room in there. That said, Miss Yellen is going to come in and dump a trillion dollars of bank reserves on them. So, I mean, I don't know the exact uh, calculations, but I doubt that increasing IOER or IOR by five basis points is going to do much when you're trying to combat a tidal wave of bank reserves coming from Janet Yellen. It's like trying to set up a, a couple, you know, bags of gravel when you're trying to, to uh, fend off a, a tsunami or, or something like that. It's really not going to work, but uh, this is what they're saying. Um, now, this guy seems to get it. He says the Fed essentially has to place a raised floor in the U.S. economy to keep things that need positive rates alive. So he's saying that they need to do this or at least try to make sure that those T-bills are above zero and not going dipping into negative. And uh, here he he says something that I completely agree with. No matter how well intentioned they are, the Fed, their efforts to engineer things are slowly weakening the system. He said, you have another bad auction or two and we're screwed. So meaning that sure, this may be a temporary Band-Aid and even this Operation Twist may be a Band-Aid, but at the end of the day, we haven't solved the problem. We've just exacerbated it while we've kicked the can down the road. And another thing I want to point out here is the big problem that, that, of course, they don't even address in CNBC because, quite frankly, I don't think they understand. It's that there's too many bank reserves. All this quantitative easing, the Fed taking their balance sheet, the $7.5 trillion, that's how they buy stuff, is, is by creating these bank reserves out of thin air. That's the problem. So you've got way too many bank reserves. And... It sounds shocking to say it, but not enough collateral, meaning not enough treasuries, not enough government debt. That's kind of a, a mind blower right there. But if you just look at it within the scope of bank reserves to government debt or treasuries, there's just not enough treasuries and there's way too much, excuse me, of the bank reserves. So... Are these bank reserves going to stop? Like, like, is the Fed just going to say, okay, we're, we're, we're done with our quantitative easing? Are they going to say, okay, we're just done monetizing the government debt? Probably not. In which case, you just, like, the Mr., uh, what's his name? Uh, Christopher Whalen. Like he said, you're just, okay, you fix the problem, but we're still screwed <laughs> in a couple of weeks. And then let's go back to Operation Twist. So they're buying the long end of the curve. They're selling the short end. Okay, if it, let's think this through. If the Fed has enough T-bills on their balance sheet to sell, to match up with the uh, bank reserves, that they need to buy at the long end of the curve, 
then on net balance, yes, it's a wash. But if the Fed doesn't have enough T-bills, then the only way they can buy the long end of the curve is by doing what? Creating more T-bills out of thin air, excuse me, creating more bank reserves out of thin air, which makes the problem even worse. And especially if they're trying to do yield curve control, which I went over in my video. If they're trying to do yield curve control, then th again, they're, they're, they're screwed because they're buying those bonds at the long end of the curve, but they're creating additional supply of bank reserves. And if there isn't additional supply of, uh, of T-bills, then you, you just, you're just exacerbating the problem again. So the Fed is painting themselves into a corner where, I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's the end game now that I think about it. Maybe that's it. Maybe the end game is the whole system implodes under the weight of bank reserves. And the only thing the Fed could do, or anyone could do, to fix the problem would be quantitative tightening. But we know what quantitative tightening would do to the stock market. And we also know what quantitative tightening would do to interest rates. Because remember, quantitative tightening is when the Fed is selling bonds. They're selling treasuries. In other words, they're creating more supply of treasuries. Therefore, the price, most likely, would go down which means the interest rate would go up. And maybe maybe that's it. Maybe that's the corner that they paint themselves. I mean, I've always thought about inflation being their Achilles heel. That would be the kryptonite. Because if we got inflation, then they couldn't really create more bank reserves to, to buy the long end of the curve, as an example. And then that would crush the economy. But maybe this is it. Maybe, maybe it's 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 it isn't really inflation. I mean, that could do it as well. But maybe it's that uh, these bank reserves take the short end negative. They can't, it, and it's this feedback loop, right? Where th they just and maybe the 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 T bills being negative because that affects the money market accounts. So everyone extracts their money from the money market. Maybe that affects. The dollar funding. I mean, I have to. I'd have to talk to Snyder about that, and see how that would work. Because if they, if there's a large outflow from the money market accounts, then I don't know how that would affect repo. And I, I'd have to think that one through. That, that there's a lot of moving parts for sure. But um, yeah, maybe that's it. They just can't create any more bank reserves because it takes the short end negative. And they can't have the short end negative and or, or nor can they do uh, yield curve control because they just can't print. They just can't do the bank. Yeah, I'm thinking through this out loud, obviously. And uh, yeah, maybe that's it. But uh, let's keep moving on here. So, yeah, that's cool. I gave you some food for thought for the day. <laughs> but moving on, in addition to this uh, twist implementation and adjustments to IOER, Bruce. Bruselas, Bruselas thinks the Fed will increase the rate it pays overnight repo, or excuse me, overnight repo operations from zero. This is reverse repo. This isn't really, um, this is reverse repo. So this is what the, um, so IOER is what they pay the banks that are under the Fed's umbrella. You guys know how I say that all the time? But there are banks that aren't under the Fed's umbrella. So they do reverse repo operations, which is basically kind of the same thing. They're just paying those banks for their money. And they do this to keep a floor on the, the, the interest rate. Because if they didn't, then those banks could come in and lend under the rate 
that the Fed under their target rate. And I know it's a little tough to think through because the rates are zero, but if the rates were 5%, let's say, and uh, they had IOER at that 5%, then the banks under their umbrella, they wouldn't lend against that because they could just keep those bank reserves in there and um, you know get the 5% risk free. So why would you lend, why would you do anything with those bank reserves that would yield under a 5% return? You know, it, that doesn't make sense. So that's how they put a floor on it. But there's banks outside of the system that would say, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do whatever I need to do. And I don't want to say lend because they're not lending out the bank reserves specifically. But um, the, the lending process would mean that those bank reserves go to another bank's account with the Fed. I know that's confusing and I need a whiteboard to explain it, but just bear with me. Uh, so, so they could say, OK, we'll do something with those bank reserves. That's a better way to say it to get a 4.5% because um, there's a lot of competition out there and we'll take the 4.5%. So the, the Fed has to do the reverse repo transactions to take that money from those banks that are not under the Fed's umbrella to make sure they're getting a return that's equivalent to the target rate that the Fed has set. And this is uh, uh, just today on CNBC, where you've got Rick Santelli talking to this gentleman from um, PIMCO, I believe. So this is a expert right from PIMCO. I mean, I'm sure he's got his master's from Harvard or, <laughs> or something like that. So for those of you who watched my video on Thursday night, you can compare my video to what this guy is talking about and how well he articulates the problem. And then you can come to your own conclusion on the value of an Ivy League education or the value of taking a traditional course in economics. <laughs> and, uh, you may come to the conclusion that just learning things on YouTube and podcasts has uh, quite a bit of value. But uh, here you go. Let's listen to what he has to say. Because I really want to talk to you about something I heard at the beginning of February, and that is, is that the Treasury has amassed huge amounts of money in their general account at the Fed. And that shouldn't be surprising. It was to combat the pandemic and all the different policy incentives they had. This amount is over one and a half trillion. Janet Yellen announced earlier this month she wants to ship it back to the Fed. Is this going to be an issue, Jerome? And what kind of effects going to have on money markets? So in the near term, uh, we think that this is something that's going to put a little bit of pressure. I, I don't know what the heck just happened right there. I don't know what I hit to make this thing shrink. Sorry about that. Oh, here we go. Maybe that. There we go, guys. But uh, I just wanted to point out there that Rick Santelli, I don't know that he maybe he just misspoke there, but it's not like they're shipping it back to the Fed. Um, the TGA is at the Fed. So the, the TGA is a liability of the Federal Reserve. Um, if, if Janet Yellen spends the money, she's not shipping it back <laughs> to the Fed. It's already at the Fed. So just wanted to clarify so you guys weren't getting confused there. On money market rates. You know, undoubtedly, central banks have done their best over the past few years to make it really unattractive for savers to put money at banks in this regard. What this does is shifting the Treasury's general account is actually puts even more pressure on funding rates. In fact, we might even see some T-bill rates trade negative. Don't confuse it, Rick, with monetary policy turning negative in terms of benchmark rates, but you're going to see market levels potentially turn negative in repo rates and T-bill rates, etc., all said, it means that if you are a saver, if you're sitting on the sideline, if you're worried about the volatility you're seeing in risk markets or even rates markets out the curve, the way to think about it is to gently move into a broader subset of categories in the short end that avoid zero rates, that avoid the potential for negative rates, but yet still allow you to return that 1% to 2% return with a lower volatility threshold. And the key to this is volatility management at this point in time. Undoubtedly, the Fed's going to be on hold for some period of time. Jerome Powell has continually said that we have not yet reached that unemployment and that inflation metric and is going to be patient in this regard. He'll do that again this week in terms of reiterating that. But he's going to speak in more precise terms. As any painter knows, 
you're going to effectively see that we're going to be moving from an abstract form of art to a very concrete, realistic form of art using figurative language. And that figurative language will allow the Fed to be even more... <laughs> All right. I'm sorry about I, I didn't mean to I don't mean to make fun of this guy. But <laughs> what the hell are you talking about, dude? What? Abstract art or concrete art? Okay. Maybe he just needs a whiteboard. I don't know. But you can see how now CNBC and PIMCO and a lot of the, the, the big wigs out there, they're starting to think through this uh, this TGA problem that uh, Janet Yellen is potentially thrusting upon the market. Now, I don't know if she can reverse course and and not spend that money in there or spend it more slowly, but uh, we'll see. It's definitely something that needs to be on our radar. And that's why I did the video Thursday. That's why I'm bringing this to your attention and kind of thinking it throughout loud. And um, maybe I'll even do another whiteboard video on it uh, tomorrow from a different angle. Maybe I'll, op I'll outline this operation twist, maybe a quote unquote solution, because I didn't really outline that uh, on Thursday's video because I just didn't have time. It was already like a 40 minute video. So uh, let's go back to the live stream. Oh, geez, man, I didn't, I guess I get on those tangents and I, I lose track of time. So, well, we've got a lot of people on the live stream. So I guess you guys were, I didn't bore you too badly <laughs> with, with what I was saying. All right. Uh, cool. So do we have any, I, I guess I don't have too much time here, but uh, let me see if I've got a couple questions. If you guys have something regarding the TGA specifically. All right, Brian, that's a good question, buddy. But I'm to, I, I, just because I'm so short on time, I'm going to try to find a question that's pertaining to the TGA or this um, Operation Twist 2.0, we'll say. All right, so it doesn't look like I've got too many questions on that. What I'll do, guys, is uh, I'll do another live stream in about an hour or two. And I'll try to keep it like 10 minutes so I've got more time to answer questions. So let me go ahead and do some shout outs for everyone that was cool enough to all the rebel capitalists out there that hit the notification bell or, or clicked on the little uh, icon where the notification thing where YouTube told you this was a live stream. So let me do the shout outs for all those awesome rebel capitalists out there. We've got Moody the Millennial is always, always here. Moody, thanks for hanging out with us today. We appreciate it. Peter Frauen, Cam White, EBCRR Melody Project, Debbie Hewson, Nick Baker, Magic End Puppet, Anthony D. Fed Federico, Anthony D. Federico, Jackie Alley, Anthony, my good buddy here. Maybe on the road, driving somewhere, being productive, making money, taking care of the family. <laughs> Good for you, Anthony. Angelique is here as well. Nick Howden, Blender and Jim Addict, Eric M, RR, Daniel McKiskey, Israel Mendoza, Owen Shapiro, Owen Benjamin Shapiro, Dwayne Hunt, Tim Keller, Peter Kinnan. Antoff Rofe, All Nighter Hider, Wayne Smith, Blade Nardoni. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Okay, guys, enjoy the rest of your afternoon, and uh, we'll see you in a couple hours on the next live stream.